McAuliffe tonight with Sean McAuliffe. Special guests, Clyde James, comedian Tony Martin, and the Super Jesus, plus the musical teasings of the Channel 99. But right now, please welcome the presenter of the show and part-time movie star, Monsieur Sean McAuliffe. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, no, that's very nice, very, very nice, and, uh, and, and thank you also to those of you, uh, or, or that person out there, who, who sent me that card uh, during the week. I'm feeling much better, thank you very much. One person sent me a card. Well, I thought it was a joke, Francis. Pointless. My leg injury. It'd be such a weak joke, though, wouldn't it? If Rove bo broke a fingernail, they'd be showering him with jelly beans and flowers and toys. Not everything on this show is a joke. You know, we have our real moments, don't we, Francis? Everyone now. <laughs> anyway, I don't joke about serious stuff like that. My health is important to me. I had the cartilage out on Tuesday, and uh, unfortunately there's been some complications. Can we cut to the ultrasound? Um, <laughs> I am now pregnant. I, I don't know how that happened. Complicated things though, knees. Uh, did you have a good weekend? What's this here? Nothing, I was just trying to be nice, just asking you. I enjoyed the weekend. I was at uh, John Howard's birthday party. Uh, I wasn't invited. I just, ha just happened to be at the Pizza Hut when they bought the cake out. Um, and there have been a, a few non-birthday uh, news items in the paper as well, in the Barcelona last week. McAuliffe tonight's own Matt Welsh won an event he shouldn't have even been in, and, and against, they say, the best in the world. He won the 50-metre butterfly race. An incredible achievement, I'd have thought, particularly for a human. <laughs> uh, six of the leading riders in the Tour de France, or Tour de France, as they would say in that country, have uh, passed drug tests, uh, but have been made to stop, go back and actually take them, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> Uh, injury has cut short the career of Northerly. Exactly. <laughs> the uh, seven-year-old has won over nine million dollars. I think the last seven-year-old to make that much was Gary Coleman. Uh, not, that, not that he's a horse, obviously. Or, although he did pull up lame mid-career and had to be destroyed, which is very, very sad. Australia's own Judy Davis is set to play Nancy Reagan. Uh, the other semi-final is between the Williams sisters, so that should be, should be a very, very good one. Mm. <laughs> Uh, Big Kev is in trouble with his company's shareholders. Uh, they want to oust him from the board. Still, at least if there's a leadership spill, there should be no problem cleaning it up. <laughs> Very much. Well, uh, Kuze and Uday are gone, and now Monday's all but gone. Next thing you know, it'll be the weekend again. <laughs> Actually, after seeing uh, what US forces did to that house Uday and Kuze were staying in, I'm having serious reservations about renting out my unit in Port Douglas to the Bin Laden family. Let me tell you. <laughs> yes. Incidentally, I don't know what the uproar is over the death photos of Uday and Kuza. You see pictures like that in taxis every day. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Bureau of Statistics have announced their figures are out, uh, but only by a little bit. <laughs> see here. Uh, we've got a great show lined up for you tonight. Uh, seems more sensible than putting them in a circle as we did last week. Comedian Tony Martin is here. Writer, TV presenter, critic, interviewer, raconteur and bon vivant, Clive James is here. <laughs> Certainly. We have music and lyrics from The Super Jesus. <laughs> and what show would not be incomplete without the unabsence of Francis Greenslade and the Channel 99? <laughs> I think that means you're not here tonight. Sean. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Hutchins is out tonight with Dropsy, mm -hmm. but uh, in his place, uh, Reggie from Big Brother, the former Mr. Manelli, David Guest, and Jerry Lewis. Excellent. <laughs> Lovely. Nice to, uh, nice to have him on board. Uh, well, few of us would disagree that Flashdance was a movie, 
<laughs> it, uh, it inspired thousands of young hopefuls back in 1983 and then later when it was released on video and again subsequently when it aired on television. 20 years on, it continues to inspire J-Lo and Jerry Halliwell and young hopefuls to follow their dream. One of those young hopefuls opens the show for us tonight. She says Flashdance made her what she is today. With what a feeling, please welcome Deb Man. Fantastic. <laughs> Terrific, Deb. No, 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 no. Deb, thank you. Thank you, Deb. Deb, excellent. And, uh, and Deb will be at the Palais for the next two weeks. Uh, she's replating the boiler there. <laughs> Well, for the first time, Australia will be using unmanned spy planes in the Solomon Islands. How about that, eh? Yeah, that's how bad the food is on those things. But I don't know, I think these UAVs, uh, that's uh, unmanned aerial vehicles to you, could be a little subtler. Uh, see what you think. Mm, yes. <laughs> Built by these same folks who made those Collins-class submarines, I'm thinking. Those of you who know me well will be aware of how distressed I've been by the state of soccer in this country. Uh, well, perhaps there's some light at the end of the tunnel because a new board has taken over at Soccer Australia, headed by... Bis 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 excuse me. My name is no, no. Thank you and good night, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start again. Can we roll the opening top? No, OK. Uh, anyway, it's headed by businessman Frank Lowey. A really hard name to say. And uh, tonight, one of the new board members, uh, Bobby Chocolini, is, uh, is holding a press conference in Sydney to announce the uh, future directions of Soccer Australia. And we cross live now to that press conference and Mr Bobby Chocolini. OK. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming along, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Soccer Australia, I would like to make a few points about where we believe uh, soccer is heading in this country. In light of the recent criticisms uh, that have been flowing since the release of the Crawford Report. First of all, the standard of the domestic soccer competition. Uh, the new board believes that the standard of soccer in Australia uh, will only improve when teams realise that all five players must be adept at grabbing the ball cleanly, either in the air or on the ground. Uh, without these basic ball handling skills, how can we possibly uh, <coughs> hope to compete with the great soccer clubs around the world, such as uh, AC, DC? <laughs> <coughs> right. Yeah, so uh, things, uh, things are looking good there for the AFL and the NRL. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, scientists in England have, uh, have studied DNA uh, from the skeleton of the elephant man, John Merrick, uh, seen here. And they've worked out... Uh, I can't believe you laughed at that. Uh, anyway, this is a serious bit. Anyway, they've worked out that without the disfiguring disease, uh, he would have actually looked like this. Uh, which is a great pity. Must have had a great memory, though. All right, girl goes to... Girl goes to war, girl gets captured, girl gets rescued, girl is returned home. The story of Private Jessica Lynch has been an inspirational one to so many people, as her homecoming uh, to the United States recently showed. But what is the story? No one seems to know. Jessica's new book, seen here, I Don't Remember a Dang Thing, doesn't so much answer the question as ask it again. Now, at 850 pages, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit of a read. And as you know, I prefer the, uh, the talking book version, which uh, rather bravely, I think, in this case, Private Lynch has decided to read herself. And I think we have a little piece of it to play. Um, I think there was... No. Yeah, sorry, and nothing. Nothing at all. Um, oh, a big... No. <laughs> Perhaps if I get hit in the head again, that always works in cartoons. <laughs> no, I got nothing. All right, and of course, uh, Sean Connery does the index. Ladies showering together. Bed six. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, big news in the world of... <laughs> yeah. Big world in the news of chickens recently. Uh, there's the story. There it is there. Uh, Sir Paul McCartney has accused fast food giant KFC of condoning cruelty to chickens. And look, it's no wonder he's upset. We've managed to get some footage. Tell me if this isn't barbaric. <laughs> oh, 
and his poor animals. Ironic that he was in a band called Wings, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yes, it's true. Isn't it all, is it really? All right, however, uh, not everyone agrees with Sir Paul's accusations. <laughs> yes, yes, good point and well made. All right, to take us to the break, though, a tribute to two men. It's sad when the famous are taken from us, uh, doubly sad when it's, it's two of them. The world, I think, will be a poorer place now that they are gone. Yes, no, I quite agree. All right. <laughs> Too tasteless, apparently. All right, uh, still to come, Tony Martin, Clive James, the Super Jesus, and to take us to the break, a reprise of Deb Madigan with What a Feeling! And welcome back. And I believe we can uh, we can rejoin the Soccer Australia press conference now. So let's cross back to Sydney for take two. <coughs> Look, uh, th thanks for staying around, everyone. Look, I just wanted to um, correct a statement that I made earlier. Um, I don't know how it happened. There must be some gremlins in the system or something. Uh, it is, of course, only one player on each team who is able to handle the ball. Uh, that player being the. Um, uh, the uh, the, the, that being the, the player who stands in front of the, um, the puck. Uh, still having some technical difficulties there, so we'll move on. Uh, Flummox by the array of goods at your local food emporium? <laughs> then you need to have a look at Lavinia Nixon's Consumer Power. Tips. Consumer Power. Tips. I like crumpets. <laughs> Consumer Power. Tips. Well, my first guest is a name which has been used before. Tony Martin wowed them in the Marx Brothers films A Night at the Opera and A Day at the Races in the late 30s, and again 60 years later in East Street, Blue Murder and Wild Side. Of course, those are two other Tony Martins. Tonight, we've got the funny one who works with Mick Malloy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Martin. <laughs> Coming along. Yes, this is the only show I haven't ruined yet. <laughs> it's well, 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 I'm looking forward to it tonight. Uh, and in fact, thank you for, for coming along because I know we, you helped us out with the pilot. And uh, yeah, and it, mm. uh, there was a, a, a well, you know, it didn't go to plan. You told me that you, your favourite film was uh, was Aliens, uh, yeah. which was the sequel to the to the Alien. Uh, anyway, mm. I think have we got that on? Uh, we've got that here. Let's just have a look. This is from the pilot. <laughs> Why would you do that? Yes, yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I am sorry. Never mind. It That's couldn't right. happen two times. Okay. Well, now, you've made your own favourite film, though, haven't you? Because you've made a, made a film, Bad Eggs. And, yes, uh, and you're it, in it. I'm in it, and it opened on Thursday. Mm. And uh, they, they can calculate, can't they, from the weekend how it's going to go. Oh, it's a nightmare. And, and we've had our ass kicked by the Terminator, oh. I'm afraid. The Terminator, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. There you go. Uh, they, they obviously want to see your film. Well, no, we're third behind the, right. the Terminator and Charlie's Angels, and it's kind of ironic for people who know me because we did a sketch of the Terminator 3 mm -hmm. on the radio about seven years ago. I remember at the time going, well, that could never really happen. <laughs> there would never really be a Terminator 3, but, you know, Arnold is obviously laughing now. So much for your humour. <laughs> You'll be saying. So apart, well, I mean, you, you know, apart from Arnold, what's, a, what's Terminator 3 got that Bad Eggs hasn't got? Because well, Bad Eggs has got everything, hasn't it? It's, well, Terminator has a lot of spectacle, a lot of big budget spectacle. I've, I've got a clip from, from Bad Eggs, if you like. You can see the kind of spectacle sure. we're, we're turning on. I'd, this is a, a clip featuring Bob Franklin. If we've got a force in 94, you know what one of my first jobs was? Every week I had to go down to Channel 7 and sort of mill about behind the host of Australia's most wanted. The alleged offender entered the quick and go yeah, shop. Yeah, sort of walk through shots, maybe answer a call, sign something. 
You're pretty good at it, too. Get some good work, man. And wearing what appeared to be a pair of drawn-on sunglasses. After a brief series anyway, one week, I got a bit too ambitious. To possibly have a gun. I decided to climb the ladder at the back of the studio. You know, like I'm, I'm looking for an old case file or something. A life-size cutout of Merv Hughes. If you have any information which may be... By that. And, uh, and Bob died, didn't he? He did, sadly, but he'll be back for the DVD. All right. Which you're preparing at the moment, I hear. <laughs> I so, right? think I, you've got to do all that. And I, but I'm in the middle of this. is the sixth week of my mm. publicity is this, tour. Um, is this the final show you're appearing on? I think, I think if I can mention another channel, I think I'm on Bert oh, I see. tomorrow morning. I'm taking Bob Franklin along, so that'll be mystifying <laughs> <laughs> if you've got to watch. Well, has it, been, has it been fun? I mean, it is probably pretty hard to sort of... Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, you're interested in the film you've oh, made, but to generate the, to read, to, to pretend that it's I've the first time you've talked about it. Foolishly put the name Eggs in the title. Mm -hmm. So over the last three weeks, I've been photographed with eggs. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to get into a giant egg cup. I've been asked to hit the top of Mick Malloy's head with a big spoon. Um, and you don't say no to any of this. You no, can't never. It's to, all really. good promotion. Just you know, it's, you've got to be careful what you call the film. We're glad we didn't call it bad anal probe. <laughs> Mistake. No, leading with your chin, really, with that one. <laughs> That's right. Um, but hey, here's something that happened to me on the yeah. publicity tour. And this is something I've been warned about. When, you know when you do a press interview, the journalist comes in, they have a dictaphone, and they put it down on the desk, and they go, you mind if I record this? And I'd been told that occasionally a journalist will do this trick. They'll finish the interview, and they'll just forget that they've left it there and leave the room and tape you talking to a publicist oh, or, or so, and then they'll come back in and take the tape recorder. And that actually happened to me in Brisbane. The guy walked out and left it running. And so I've just started saying things like, um, to my wife, I've just started going, um, give, give Mick a call, because I think um, Natalie Imbruglia's pregnancy test <laughs> results are coming out today. Just in a desperate attempt to create some rumours, so hopefully we'll be did getting... It, you did it get in? Did you, did you... <laughs> oh, well, we're waiting to see. Oh, right, okay, well, but <laughs> but you... give it a burl if it happens to you. Do you... Do you... I mean, you're, you're a student of film. Yes. You, you know, you love films. I look yeah, like a nerd. How, how, Correct. <laughs> but he's, well, I love, I, I, love, I love them too. And I, well, it's maybe I, I, mean, I'm, I look like a nerd as well. But uh, the, uh, how many would you see a year? How many, how many oh, films? I see about 100 to 300 films a year. 100 yes. to 300. <laughs> That's right. And when did you, does it actually, does it actually being a student of film actually, uh, you know, help you make films? I don't think it does because you just, people who watch a lot of films, their films tend to be full of annoying sort of, pastiches and references to, yeah. to other films. But the first film I ever made when I was a kid was a Super 8 movie. And it was a, it was a Batman parody, right. in fact. Um, and because, I don't know if you ever ha had this happen to you, when I was a kid, my, uh, my grandmother, I agreed to let her knit me a, a Batman costume. <laughs> um, no, I thought that would be Nisses. fine. You know, Alfred makes all of Bruce Wayne's gear. Yeah, but he wouldn't knit it, would he? He'd well, sew it, Alfred wouldn't. wouldn't be working from a pattern in the Woman's Weekly. Right. Uh, if you can imagine an all-over grey tea cosy, mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's very hard to strike fear into the hearts of criminals when your bat cow has a pom-pom on the top. <laughs> And, uh, you know, a, a jaunty scarf is no substitute for a scary cape, mm -hmm. I find. But, so that was the... Uh, Sorry, how old were you at this point? I was about 28. No, right. I, was, I was about nine. But that was the, the very first film I made, mm -hmm. was just a, an absolutely serious Batman movie with absolutely serious situations going on, except that Batman had a costume knitted by his grandmother. And that was the, the premise for mm -hmm. the film. Mm -hmm. And I've realised that's what Bad Eggs basically is. It's the same idea. Oh, it's, it's a serious cop movie with, with idiots dropped into the, into the centre of it. But listen to this, Sean. Yes. This actually happened. That film, that Batman movie, came, on the, uh, it came up as third prize winner on a children's television afternoon program on New Zealand television and I had to go on TV and be presented with my third prize film splicer by Richard Wilkins, <laughs> then bird. known as Richard Wilde on New Zealand television. Is he used to right? be Richard Wilde okay. before he moved out here. Right. So it came number three came and now you're three. number three Oh, again. now number three at the box office still. Ca career has come full circle. <laughs> that's right. Well, no, that's... Uh, now, we take, we take calls occasionally oh, uh, on the show. Is that all right? Yeah. Just ask some questions on. about bad eggs or whatever? Right. Sure. Uh, oh, you might be not about bad eggs. Yeah, sure, sure. That, that, is, that is my own personal water. <laughs> uh, let's take some calls. And uh, First up, it's, uh, it's Matt from Barcelona. Is this Matt Welch, the swimmer? 
Yeah, 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 Sean, it's me, yeah, I'm at the World Championships. Oh, how's it going over there, Matt? Bad luck about the second place thing. Yeah, I, I won the butterfly, though. Did you? I didn't, didn't see that one. So it's uh, <laughs> going well, though, is it, over there? Yeah, 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 it's going really well, thanks, Sean. Yeah, how's it going over there? Good, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's good, yeah. Uh, listen, uh, now I've got Tony Martin here with me. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Uh, uh, well, I mean, not really. I, I just got this free phone card and I wanted to use it up before I came home. <laughs> right, right. So, so you've been well there, Sean? Yeah, yeah, yeah I've been well. I'm good, thanks, uh, Matt. Look, if you don't have a question, we should really... Well, yeah, no, it, it's been really hot over here, actually, thanks for asking. You know, it's, it's sort of hot and humid. Although they say that's pretty normal for Barcelona this time of year, or it's actually Barcelona, as it's more correctly pronounced. Yeah, listen, uh, listen, Matt, I... Uh... Have, you, have, you, have you been to Barcelona there, Sean? OK, yeah? Matt, we'll have to leave it there. Hang on, hang on, I've still got $34 of credit left. OK, OK then, Matt. What time is it over there? Goodbye, Matt. <laughs> I'm so lonely. Uh, but you haven't have on the show one time and there you just mate. Please continue that. Please take Tony Martin. Thank you. Bad Eggs is in the cinemas now. And uh, we'll be right back with Clive James. Well, if you, if you like surprise chef and surprise wedding, you'll love electroshock therapy. Oh, it's just... <laughs> which presumably is just around the corner for you. Uh, you may also like this. Surprise! Yes, it's Surprise Dwarf, and Francis Greenslade is on location. You there, Francis? Yes, I am, Sean. I'm at the lovely Waterfront restaurant. So, um, let's talk to these people over here. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm uh, Francis Greenslade from McAuliffe tonight, and, uh, and your name is? Sylvia. Sylvia, and your sir? Werner. Sylvia and Werner, beautiful names, beautiful names. You must be very proud. Get on with it. But of course. Uh, well, Sylvia and Werner, we at McAuliffe tonight understand that um, even though you're with someone, perhaps in a relationship, you can still feel very much alone. So tonight, be our guest, please, and enjoy the warm, good-humoured company of Brett... Your surprise dwarf! <laughs> Back to you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. Sure, Delightful. I should, I, I, <laughs> yes. I should just warn you that uh, I did work on a Channel 9 program once, and when that dwarf appears on your show, it usually means it's about to be axed. Oh, no. <laughs> Fatal. That exact one, too. Okay. Is that right? <laughs> Arthur. Uh, look, you can't blame Arthur for that. No. Um, now, uh, <laughs> I, should, I should say that if, if Surprise Dwarf uh, can get just half the ratings of uh, a Surprise Chef, that would seem uh, perfectly appropriate. <laughs> uh, my next guest has been writing for over 40 years. History, language, poetry, memoir, or just suckling from the cathode teat of Mother Video, he draws his inspiration from likely and unlikely sources, and his infectious speech pattern has influenced many a schoolboy. Boy. Please welcome broadcaster, author, poet and youth swimming champion, Mr. Clive James. Clive, if you can negotiate there. I'm just so yeah. honoured to meet, to meet you. Oh, well, thank you very much. And, and to be too. sitting next to Tony Martin, who's an authentic working dog. You're a working dog, aren't no, you? No, no, I'm affiliated. You're affiliated to working dog. Because <laughs> yes. working dog, working dog makes these terrific movies. I saw The Dish in uh, London, and the BBC asked me to go on and say what I thought of it. I thought it's exactly the kind of movie Australia should be making. Well, Tony's made Bad Eggs. Have you seen Bad Eggs? <laughs> I haven't seen Bad Eggs yet, but uh, is it in the current festival? Is it coming up? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's up against the Terminator. Clive. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> or, or, or Matrix 2. Which some, some of us only see for Monica Bellucci. So you have to wait for quite a while before she comes on. Do you, do you, do you, do you I'm like still waiting for Monica Bellucci to come on. Come to think of it. Come on. Do, you go to the, do you go to the big, do you go to the big no, blockbuster films? No, I'm films? a DVD man. I'm past the age of going to the cinema. I long ago ceased to go to the actual cinema. The cinema now comes to me in the form of DVDs. I have a magnificent DVD collection. I'm currently watching the whole of The Sopranos again. Oh, I see. As I become more and more to resemble Tony Soprano. <laughs> 
physical aspect and indeed personality. Right. And, and, and you're, still, you're still a big fan of television? Because television has uh, been a great source of inspiration I'm for you. I'm a fan of television, but I'm even watching television on DVD. I, I watch the whole of the West Wing over and over, for example, mm -hmm. waiting for Martin Sheen to grow older. He doesn't somehow. But, uh, no, I, I, I love that, that whole aspect of, uh, of series television I love. The actual television, the stuff that you see on the channels where, uh, dare I say it, uh, the reality television. Well, we just see we just finished we just Big Brother, it, yeah, and we just finished Big Brother. And we're yeah. just starting Australian Idol, and I think both incarnations yeah, yes. have uh, been and gone in. It uh, has in the been UK. suggested in, uh, in 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 Britain by several times by some of uh, some of my ex-critical colleagues who are still critics that I could revive my flagging career by going on a thing called "I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here," mm -hmm. which is actually recorded in Australia in a thousand square yards of Australian jungle in Queensland, mm -hmm. and if they fight their way out through snakes and spiders. And I said, those are the circumstances in which I was born and raised. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> you escaped in your 20s, didn't you? Went to yeah. the UK. And... Yeah. Would you do that now, do you think? Would you leave... I wouldn't uh... have to. I'd... I was probably wrong then, in 1961, because the country was already being changed by the, the immigration. But the migrants were changing it from the basement up, and they hadn't got much beyond the kitchen at that stage. But... Uh... And ten years later, under when Whitlam's government came in and changed everything, it became gradually less and less common uh, to feel that, that all the real action was abroad. Because the real action was obviously here. Mm -hmm. And now it's sensationally obvious that the real action is here. Right. When you arrive in Australia, you can practically hear the zing. That wasn't quite true when I was young. Australia was a bit sleepy. You know that dreadful thing that uh, Arva Gardner said when she landed here to make... Uh, to make the film, what was it called, On the Beach? On the Beach, I think, yes. You do know what you do. I can the see it in your eyes. World. She said, they sure picked the right spot to make a movie about the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, she was lucky to get out of Australia after yeah. she said that. Yeah. But uh, she, she, she wasn't entirely wrong. It felt very sleepy. And then it started to pick up and pick up. And the truth is, when you examine these things historically, it was already picking up. Australia, uh, straight after World War II, was starting mm -hmm. to boom. Um, you, you're, often, uh, you're often in a threesome. With, uh, with, uh, <laughs> you've been pleased to know, with Jermaine Greer and, uh, <laughs> this is what's gonna a happen. sort of an ex expat. Is this going to happen tonight? No, no, not tonight, not tonight. No, no. No, God, I wouldn't wish that on you. Uh, but with uh, an expatriate threesome with Robert Hughes and, and uh, Jermaine Greer, you were seen, you, were, yeah. you three were seen as leaving together and, uh, and we're always and a little indeed, bit... And indeed sleeping together. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, and, and Barry Humphreys actually left a bit earlier, and mm. then there was, there was Peter Porter, the poet, and there was Michael Blakemore, the director, and so on. In those days, it was thought that the action and that sort of, that branch, that kind of show business, was abroad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I've got a feeling that it was already here. And uh, I think the really creative people at the time were, were people like Gordon Chater and, uh, and George Wallace, the, mm -hmm. the musical people, Roy Reen, Moe, and so on. There's a, what we now see as a tremendous heritage was already there. Mm -hmm. So the, the people at the time were making a bit of a mistake. But on the other hand, for them, it was a, it was a creative mistake. And, mm -hmm. they, and they got abroad and, uh, and they did things. And I think they became part of Australia's cultural expansion. There was a, for a while, people thought that the, the expatriates had, had sold their country short. I never thought that was true. I think with the, that we were part of Australia's impression on the world. It wasn't just Hogan the Bogan slinging the, the, the prawn on the barbie. It was, uh, it was uh, some other people doing things abroad and they became part of Australia's image and I don't think it hindered and I think it might have helped. Do you think the media, the media when, you, when say you return or, or Jermaine Greer returns or Robert Hughes or even Barry Humphreys, we, they wonder what you think uh, of us. Uh, they wonder what you think uh, has changed since you've been away. But they're less bothered now about your opinion. There mm -hmm. was a time when you had to watch your words. Now I think you could say anything. And uh, I think the, the Sydney Olympics made that change, but really Australia had already changed with the Melbourne Olympics. What really changed Australia, I'm convinced, was the Melbourne Olympics. Because remember, the, the Melbourne, the Olympic Village wasn't finished, mm -hmm. and the word went out, will anyone sort of take a foreign athlete as a guest? Yeah. And the answer was overwhelming. Thousands of people wanted foreign athletes as a guest, and, and, and the more ethnic, the better. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so effectively, the old white Australia policy, which was a real a real hobble on Australia's development was finished from that day. It just took, the legislation took time. But Australia started to become, that day, one of the world's most successful multicultural countries. And it has. It's done. That's why I get a little bit shirty when I'm asked to believe that Australia is a racist country. But I think people who say that haven't really seen a racist country. Mm -hmm. you know, try Liberia, for example, mm -hmm. or, or Rwanda. Yeah. Are you a fan of John Howard? Well, I'm a fan in the sense that I thought he would win, and I now think that he will rule forever. <laughs> uh, I can only be removed by a coup d'etat. And the funny thing is that Peter Costello thinks the same thing. Mm. <laughs> and uh, no, I think Howard, uh, 
Howard has got a lack of style which ensures his success in Australia. I don't think the Australian electorate... <laughs> I don't think the Australian electorate really like style. They rather admired Paul Keating's suits, but they didn't want to have a suit like that. Do you think they're threatened by, uh, do you think they were threatened by Keating's style? Uh, Keating of all people, because Keating is a very, very subtle mind. I've, I've, I've read the new book on him and I decided I, 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 mis I underestimated Keating because his language in Parliament was so violent. I thought he was simple-minded, but it's not true. He was a very, very subtle guy. But I think the stylish stuff was a mistake with the Australian electorate. When Howard appeared at Nambucker Heads in a pair of long shorts and a handkerchief knotted in the corners over his head, <laughs> I thought, this man is going to be Prime Minister forever. <laughs> Do you, I, I don't want to equate, uh, I don't want to equate John Howard with Reggie from Big Brother, but uh, Big, Big Re Reggie from Big Brother, I don't know if you saw, she, she, I just wonder whether, whether Australians like non-threatening uh, who tend to, tend to warm to non-threatening people like John Howard or Reggie. I don't think, I think there are plenty of Australians who tell you that uh, John Howard isn't non-threatening at all. They find him extremely threatening. And in fact, when I read the press, I think we've now reached the stage where nobody will vote for John Howard except the population. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is against him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, um, you, you've written a book and you did a television series about fame in the 20th century. And uh, we spoke briefly about reality television. I'm just wondering whether it's too early. Would it be too early for you to write a book about fame in the 21st century? Do you think that's changed? I think, uh, there's not much of a century yet, is there? But uh, I think fame is already... I think celebrity value is lessening. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would be very good if it did. Uh, and, and one of the advantages of the reality shows, if everyone can be famous for 15 minutes, as Andy Warhol predicted, that it makes fame less a uh, point of obsession. And I'm all for that. I, I think there was too much of it. The, the, the papers are too, too full of it. And it's too boring. On the other hand, it could be handy. I'm going to be touring this country Yes, in you're September. famous. You're famous in your Well, if I wasn't well known, there wouldn't be much point saying, hey, my show was on, because no, you know, nobody would come at all. Right. So fame does come in handy. But it's, I think it should only come in handy to draw attention to something you intend to achieve. Fame, for its own sake, is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, not meaningless. This tour isn't meaningless, because it's a, it's a, it's a no, celebration it, of a friendship and also a, a great body of work that you've been working on for many years. Is well, it? tourism. Yes, tourism. No, no, your, your songs. Your, your, it's a, oh, your you tour mean tour a, oh, that kind of tourism. Your, your, right, tour, right, yeah, yeah. your tour, is on, tour is on. I didn't yeah, articulate that. Oh, oh, right. Okay. Uh, uh, words uh, and music is... is uh, yeah, I've been working on these songs off and on for 40 years, mainly off, because the first time we did it 35 years ago, call it 35 years, mm -hmm. it didn't really succeed commercially, what me and my friend Pete Ackham were doing. We sold thousands of records, but in those days you had to sell, sell millions. So we went out of business for about a quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. And then a few years ago it started to revive wonderfully. And now, actually by public demand, we just toured for the second year running. I'm going to find out in Australia whether it's by public demand in Australia. I might find out the hard way. Well, we, we, I, I don't know whether we can trust you because the last time you were involved in music, this is what you gave us. Oh, my God. What have you got? I... Ah. Hello. Oh, there is a cracker's You are, you are responsible for Margarita, aren't you? Uh, hitting the stage. And that was a tour she did of Australia. What you don't realise, I was Margarita. It was a very oh, I good see. <laughs> Didn't you see how we were hardly ever on screen at the same time? <laughs> that's shot? very true, that's yeah. very true. But uh, you're not dragging up for this tour. This is with Peter no, Atkin, no, who's Pete, a... Peter, Peter Atkin uh, plays it straight. He's got fairly violent coloured socks, but apart from that, he plays it straight. And he sings the songs, and I sit there on stage and help the audience listen to them. And then in between the songs, I get up and I give my opinions on world affairs and Australian politics and so on. And then he sings again. And it's a pretty full night. It's, it, it, well, I don't think we saw the audience should. Well, and I'm, the, I'm, this, uh, a man with a basket has sorry. just appeared. Lou. Hello, Lou. Hello, Lou. Yes. Yes, and yeah, can can we assist you in any way? <laughs> no, I think put these prizes on for Clive. It's the uh, the new board game, the Dick Pictionary. Right. Oh, right. You've got the Jets from Arnott. Oh, they're fantastic. Right, yeah. And not forgetting uh, the Walkermans. You yeah. love that. Sorry, Clive. Yeah. Uh, 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 and just sorry, a moment. That's I'm just all right. I'm just explaining. Clive, uh, Lou does this uh, other show. Uh, he's obviously got it mixed up with. Uh, have you got no. it mixed up with the other show? I thought it was dark for uh, for Sunday <laughs> afternoon. Really. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lou. Uh, thank you, Lou. Please stay with us. Uh, best, very best of luck with the tour, Clive. Uh, we've got the dates. Have we got the dates here? On the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's the Clive James Words and Music Australian Tour from September 11 to October the 4th. Yeah, it ends up in Mandurah on October the 4th, and there's competition there. They've got raising dogs in Mandurah. Excellent. So we start here in Melbourne on September 11th, and we haven't got no raising dogs here, so we expect a no, full we house. We do have Pictionary, yeah. though, got Clive. Pictionary. Oh, right. Right. Uh, Listen, I forgot to mention this, Clive. You've got the latest copy of the Herald Sun. Oh, God, oh, that's, that's really. Really. Thank you, Lou Richards, Clive James, and uh, Tony to Martin. I get to keep this? Yes, yes, yes. Right, the right after the third in our series of ad breaks.
I'm, uh, I'm uh, out of frame now, but I'm, I'm chatting with Sarah from the Super Jesus. Sarah from the Super Jesus. Oh. Oh. It's just a taste of how they're going to receive. You're going to oh, perform great, for yeah. us in a minute as well, not yes. just a chat, isn't it? Yes, I'm going to chat and I'm going to sing at the same time. Oh, you know, I heard uh, I heard on the radio yesterday. Was it yesterday? You were talking about how your uh, your uh, your partner uh, Chris uh, makes your clothes for you. Is that uh, true? Or are you joking? Has been known to make some. Did he make that lovely denim? Uh, no, no, but this is something. Uh, not unlike his creations. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. He's got a certain style. It's that sort of ragged, you know, devil may care kind of thing. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. I get impressed. clothes and he chops them up. Francis makes my suits them. for me. Did, oh, were you aware of that? Nice. Yes, this runs really? them very nicely. Yes, no, you're indeed. on a wicket there, mate. Excuse me, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Talk amongst yourself. Hello. <laughs> All oh, right. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Yeah. No, it's all right. Tell her. Okay. No. You hang up first. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sarah, excuse me. Just, just one moment. Uh, one, one last uh, time. We're, we're crossing back uh, out to Soccer Australia. Uh, thank you for staying on, everyone. Look, um, obviously there are eleven players in a soccer team, not five, and uh, it's certainly not a puck. It's a goal. Everybody knows it's a goal. Um, I'm sorry. The mistakes were made by some spastic we've got more experience this what what is it what jeez uh, uh sorry about that's that that's a bit rude yeah, a bit rude uh, uh now now you're going to perform what song for us tonight over and out okay over and out now you know we have a rule here we don't have the miming the lip syncing you're not going to do that for us tonight oh no we wouldn't mime mate right. are you crazy now, and in order to, but well, they're very cynical, this audience, so I just wondered whether you would mind dropping in a word for us. We always ask Percy Sledge, uh, did the, his song, When a Man Loves a Woman Without His Trousers On, uh, other people say words, would you mind, would you like to say a word? We, we have a, picked a word for you. It's actually a oh, hyphenated. How uh, very convenient, thank yes. you. Um, it's, a, it's banana lounge. <laughs> do you think you can work that into Over and Out? Does it have to make sense? Well, the show hasn't thus far. <laughs> I don't see why okay. I should start now. Are you equal to the task? All right, I'll give it a go. Sarah's going to start with Thank you, Sarah. How bad can it be? All right, I should uh, hold the... Uh, this here is the, uh, is the CD. And, uh, and this here is the... This is your CD. This is the DVD. The DVD there. It's much the same, except a slightly different shape. And uh, here... Well, while I'm at it, this is a, a, a tape <laughs> I've made for the car. Uh, is that your demos? That's my... That's my that is, this is probably, uh, this Sean is, uh, sadly, this is probably 1984 stuff. Um, okay, well, you want to you go on, uh, you know, limber okay, up Okay, so and, what was uh, it? Banana Lounge. Banana Lounge, yes. Banana Town. No, Banana, banana lounge. lounge. Banana okay. Lounge. You can do the French. Banana, banana Town. Banana, banana Lounge. Banana Lounge. Got it. Okay, good. We stayed at a place in Coffs Harbour called Banana Town once. I'm going to get it confused. Don't get it mixed up. Sing the wrong one. Whatever okay. you do, because Thanks, it, it won't get a laugh. You'll be over there, and I'll, I'll fill while, it, while they plug in everything. All right. Now, there's talk of another actor's strike. I don't know if you heard this. Uh, this one a bit longer than the one day a couple of weeks back, and uh, I'm worried because I love Australian serial drama and I'd hate to think I'd or you'd be denied or denude uh, that uh, <laughs> weekly dose of stingers or blue healers or white colour blue. So what we've done as a sort of stopgap measure is make our own serial drama using non-union labour. Oh, what's, what's wrong with my mouth tonight? This is not working, is it? Non-union labour to be used only in an emergency. Here's a preview. The fire department has an elite undercover unit whose covert operations are unknown to the general public. These men and women are the plainclothes firefighters. Hey, Zippy, where is everybody? You better get in there. Chief's manner in hell. Uh, sue me, milkshake. Relations. <laughs> get rid of that mouse squib, Spooky. This is a goddamn fire department. What's eating him? When an arsonist changes his M.O., everything eats me, Zoom. How's he changed it, Chief? He's starting floods now. Yeah, that's a little out of our jurisdiction, isn't it? Hey, if it's too hot for you, put him for a transfer, coconut. Hey, boss, who's the uniform? Zip it, cream cake. She's from Internal Affairs. She'll be working with you on the flood maniac case. Now, get out. I ain't working with no female. Colonel female, waste goose. Take it outside, ladies. I've got work to do now. Get out. King's Fruit Loop. We take my wheels. What do you got? 1955 unmarked fire engine. Let's roll. <laughs> what are you lamb shanks doing back here? You disappoint me, boss. How did you know it was me flooded them streets? Zoom here found a signed confession under his windshield wiper. 
There goes your pension, Orlando. Now, you come in quietly or we're going to have to wear earplugs. <laughs> Sippy, all my calls for ten years. But right now, here's the Super Jesus with Over and Out. Yeah!
Put the lotion in the bucket and string up the spruker for the Christmas jig, Flaubert. It's time for audience participation, where you, the audience, get to be the star, as tonight we play Bobbing for Apples. Over to you, Beanie and Cecil. Thank you very much, Pete and Francis. Whom do you have for us tonight? Uh, no one, Sean. Uh, our contestant has yet to be chosen by the McCall of tonight, Leper. Well, <laughs> while that's happening, let's find out what our contestant is. Playing for tonight. <laughs> Pete! Sean! Francis's knee! Uh, Pete! That's right, Francis's knee. Sick and tired of long queues? Then you'll appreciate the normal-sized ones that come with this superb billiard table from Ace. And if after months of practice you're still awful, then why not cheat with a magnetic cue ball influencer? Simply turn the knob and hey presto, you gain an advantage over your friends by means of deception. Or how about this splot shelving system? And when I say system, I mean an abomination of cheap tubular aluminium that would make even Ingvar Kramrad, founder of Ikea, throw up. <laughs> Splot, it's the sound your bowels will make evacuating themselves as you lay eyes on your new hi-fi stereo. It's from JVC. We put the jiggle in technological. <laughs> And block out the sound of yourself splotting by pumping up the volume on these records from RCA. Forwards, they're the hip sound of 1977. Backwards, they contain a secret message compelling you to kill. <laughs> Thinking of becoming hideously disfigured, donning a mask and retreating to the sewers beneath Paris for the rest of your natural life? Then why not drag this organ along with you and pound away dementedly to your black heart's content? From Hammond, where every organ is vital. Back to you, Betty and Wilma. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Hit me. Hit it around. Please say... Please thank the, uh, the McCallum tonight leper, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! Excellent. Hello, hello, Michael. Hi. Ah, you're giving yourself away. Uh, Francis, a rather redundant question. Now, who do we have here? I have no idea. This is Michael from Kew, Sean. Yes. He's uh, studying to become a teacher and works weekends as a supermarket manager. He likes to play golf and his pet hate is not being allowed to have Milo in the tea room at work. I see. All right, Michael. Now, have you ever, have you ever uh, dunked your head in a barrel filled with water and fruit before? No, I haven't shown. Oh well, it's, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Pretty easily picked up. Uh, the game, not the not the drum, because that's uh, must weigh a freaking ton. Uh, each apple is numbered, and the number actually corresponds with a question that Francis will ask you, um, which will uh, if you and if you do answer it correctly, it will mean you win a fabulous prize. Pete. Oh, oh don't startle me like that. Sorry, uh, Michael. You have twenty Earth seconds, starting from now. <laughs> Uh, tonight's apples are kindly provided by uh, the good friends. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Michael and Francis. <laughs> Number three. Number three. Ooh. Wait a minute. This has never happened before, Michael. You've pulled out the power apple. <laughs> right. Doesn't make your prize any better, but uh, you know it does, does, That's a lovely sound, and they do like ringing it. Uh, what's uh, What's Michael actually won, Pete? That's right, Sean. Michael, tonight you could win the trip of a lifetime, courtesy of Tommy Von Borbel's Practical Jokes, or the Super Jesus CD, and tickets to Clive James Show Words and Music. All right, Michael. What'll it be? What'll it be? What are you gonna do? The, the CD and, and, and the tickets? Yes, or... Sean. Yes, yes. All right. Excellent. All right. Now I don't. Wanna, I don't want to sway you. Uh, oh, you've already answered the question. Okay. Uh, uh, Francis, uh, the question, s'il vous plaît. La what? La question. Oh. La question. <clears throat> All right, Michael. What is the caption to this photograph? A. New ministers inducted into Uniting Church. B. Burjo's catchphrase takes surprise new direction. C. What you talking about? <laughs> All right. Now, Michael, while you're deciding, uh, here's some think music. You may think, think. C. It's the correct answer! Well done, Michael. Thank you very much. Pete, tell us things, won't you? That's right, Sean. This one's called Winter. People like ants. From the top of my tower, my rifle trembles. Back to you, Sean. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete. And his haiku. Lovely. Before we go, a quick look at the uh, stock market. Let's see how the important shares ended up after today's trading. 
Thank God for that. <laughs> All right, thanks to our guests, Tony Martin, Clive James and the Super Jesus. Next week in this very studio, Ricky Martin, country superstar Keith Urban and comedian Dave O'Neill, just to name a few. And I'd like to thank you too for watching, or indeed any of the big Irish bands who tuned in tonight. <laughs> I thank you. To take us out tonight, another of the suspiciously plentiful supply of old clips featuring myself found in the vaults here at nine. This time it's a, an appearance of Francis, Lavinia and I. Uh, we made it on the Horry Dargy and his quartet Explode show. This is a tribute to Paul McCartney himself, Paul McCartney. See you in the Monkey House, Australia.